Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Anabios webinar. My name is Chris Mathis, and uh, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Anabios, and I'll uh, be the moderator for today's session. Um, Anabios has been doing these webinars for over a year now, even before the global pandemic hit and webinars and virtual presentations became really popular. Um, and so we've, we've decided to do something a little different today. You'll notice on the right hand side of your panel towards the bottom, there are some handouts. So you can download our DRG brochure and our human spinal cord brochure. And also today we have decided to um, do an audience poll to um, give you a chance to see what your colleagues are thinking and what they're doing in their research. And so these are the questions just to kind of uh, think about them. We will uh, do the poll before the presentation starts. First question is, do you work with human DRGs in your pain research? Number two, what are the barriers to working with human DRGs? Availability, quality, cost, all of the above or no barriers at all. And the same kind of questions uh, related to human spinal cords. So noodle those around in your brain for a few moments and then we'll get started. So Anabios is a unique contract research organization and biotech company based in San Diego. We recover human tissue samples from ethically consented donors and use the tissue or cells to perform physiological assays in which we can test preclinical compounds for drug discovery projects. We have essentially redefined first in human. And for more information about Antibios, you can go to our website or you can download one of these brochures that I mentioned. Just a few other words about Antibios. We provide ex vivo studies in human tissue. And what makes us unique is that we not only obtain the human organs, but we isolate cells and perform physiological experiments with them, which means that the quality is very high. And our partners benefit from this translational data uh, because ex vivo data um, really helps you to select the best drugs for clinical studies. We have a vast network of hospitals and transplant centers across the US only. Uh, we've really standardized this process. Uh, it's much more reliable than depending on local hospitals or university hospitals, for example. And um, we use proprietary solutions to um, ship the organs back to Anabios in San Diego, and then we prepare the cells. And the proof is in the pudding. The quality of the, the cells is high because we can do physiological assays, as I mentioned. And we've also done RIN analysis, RNA integrity scores, and uh, our scores are typically around nine, uh, which indicates very high quality. Okay, so one more review of the polling questions um, before I do them. So let's, let's do the polling questions. I see we've got uh, many people still coming in, but um, let's get started on the poll. So the first question, you should be able to see on your screen right now. And it is in progress. Do you work with human DRGs in your pain research? Okay, I'll give you uh, about 20 more seconds on that. All right, let's go to the next question. What are the barriers to working with human DRGs? Is it availability, quality, cost, all of the above, or no barriers at all for your research? I see the responses coming in. Keep them coming. Give you about uh, 10 more seconds until we go on to the next question. All right, thank you very much. Now the next question, do you work with human spinal cords in your research? Yes or no? Uh, many of you may know that Anabios has been collaborating with Eli Lilly this past year to develop a novel human spinal cord platform. Uh, for more information about that, you can um, send me an email at cmathis at antibios.com. 
Okay. And the final question, if you do work with spinal cord, even if you don't, what are the barriers to working with human spinal cords? Is it availability, quality, cost, all of the above, or no barriers at all? All right, we'll give you a few more seconds to answer that question. And then stick around at the end. Uh, there will be some time for Q&A. So um, you can answer, ask questions in the, just below the polling area uh, where it says questions. You can write those in throughout the presentation and we will get to those at the end. Okay, so thanks for participating in that poll. We'll provide the results at the end. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carol Maloto. Um, she is a general dentist and assistant professor at the Faculty of Dentistry at the University at McGill University. She obtained her dental degree from the State University of Campinas in Brazil in 2005, and has since dedicated her studies to the understanding of the role of genetics in painful conditions, with emphasis on chronic orofacial pain conditions. After a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Maloto completed her postdoctoral studies at McGill University, where she combined her clinical and genetic training to develop clinical studies aimed at translating genetic findings into clinical applications to, be to benefit chronic pain patients. Dr. Maloto's research program is focused on filling in the major gap that exists in the scientific evidence needed to support clinical practice that recognizes distinct clinical clusters of patients based on targeting their molecular pathways of vulnerability. Such recognition needs to be taken into account before treatment, both for treatment and prevention of pain chronification. Currently, Dr. Maloto is working on projects testing treatment options, targeting specific neurobiological mechanisms with the goal of determining the subgroups of patients that will benefit from these treatments. Developing a platform for the continuous enrollment of patients with acute low back pain, temporomandibular disorder, and post-operative pain with the goal of finding treatment options that prevent pain from becoming chronic, and also investigating how genetic and biopsychological uh, factors that predispose TMD apply to the use of temporomandibular joint implants with the goal of optimizing the selection criteria for TMJ implant patients. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Maloto and her presentation today. Morning, everyone. Something wrong with Thanks for joining today. My name is Carolina Meloto. I'm a professor at uh, McGill University's Faculty of Dentistry. And today uh, we're going to talk about chronic or facial pain from where we have been to where we will go. Uh, before getting uh, to it, I want to say thanks to uh, Chris Mates for the invitation, for this opportunity of talking to uh, everyone here today. And also uh, Gary, uh, Gary Watkins, for all the technical support and for uh, making this happen for me. Uh, so as I've already said, I'm a professor at the McGill Faculty of Dentistry. My background is all in dentistry. I graduated in dentistry back in 2001 and have practiced uh, for many years after that uh, with a particular focus uh, in chronic or facial pain. Uh, and at the same time, I devoted all of my graduate years uh, for the research of chronic pain, with particular emphasis on chronic or facial pain. So uh, now I've come to a point where really I'm really um, interested in what's happening right now and what I see happening moving forward uh, in this field. Uh, and I think it's very important to understand where things are going, uh, we also need to understand and it helps open our horizons if we also understand where things have been. So that's um, what we're gonna talk about today. And uh, towards the end, I'll focus specifically on the research that I am currently working on in my lab. So without further ado, let's get to it. So we will start by defining chronic or facial pain to make sure that we are all on the same page, especially for those that are not very familiar with the field. So chronic or facial pain conditions uh, uh, or chronic or facial pain is actually a term, an umbrella term that we use to describe multiple uh, conditions affecting the orofacial region uh, that have, of course, a chronic uh, characteristic, uh, an unremitting pattern, 
they are highly refractory to treatment, they are very challenging conditions, uh, very little still uh, is known about in the etiology of uh, majority of uh, the specific subtypes of chronic orofacial pain. And therefore, treating chronic orofacial pain patients is very challenging. Um, we can subdivide chronic orofacial pain into three major categories, uh, neuropathic, neurovascular, and musculoskeletal. Uh, we will focus today on temporomandibular disorders, which are pretty much the ones uh, that are um, described as musculoskeletal or facial pain conditions. Uh, so I will just give you a very quick overview of the neuropathic and neurovascular uh, conditions, and then we will focus the rest of our talk uh, going forward in uh, TMDs on TMDs. So neuropathic pain conditions, as the name says, are those involving alterations uh, in uh, the peripheral and or central nervous systems. We know now that the immune system is also involved uh, either in the etiology or, or, and or in the pathophysiology of um, these conditions. Of course, the exact details uh, remain to be clarified, but there is a lot of research being put into this right now. Uh, and I actually learned from one of my mentors now in Memorian, uh, Dr. William Maxner, that when we first started the working, uh, studying chronic pain, we didn't really know where this was going to take us, but we could only hope that it wouldn't take us to the immune system, just because it's such a complex system, uh, and uh, you know we, we really need a lot of knowledge to be able to uh, understand the underpinnings of it. But anyways, this is just to say that there is clearly a role for the immune system in neuropathic pain conditions as well as in the neurovascular and in the musculoskeletal pain conditions as well. Uh, if compared to musculoskeletal uh, conditions, uh, neuropathic are more rare. They um, they happen in about five to one hundred people per one hundred thousand, and the most common type are trigeminal neuralgias with its uh, you know excruciating throbbing type pain. Uh, then we also have burning mouth syndrome, and very little uh, is still known about it. And current the interest in burning mouth syndrome is uh, is very high. You know, there's money out there for research uh, with burning mouth syndrome, so it's really research is really being encouraged at the moment. Uh, traumatic neuropathies due to uh, whatever uh, events, traumatic events, and less common uh, or facial, neuropathic or facial pain conditions are post-herpetic neuralgia, postural pain, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, or the nervous intermediate neuralgia. The second group is uh, the group of neurovascular or facial pain conditions, which are those resulting from disturbances of the trigeminal vascular system. Uh, so here we're talking about migraines, tension type headaches, those that affect the lower two thirds of the face. Um, so there is, uh, you know, this term uh, neurovascular or facial pain, NVOP, uh, has first arised uh, in 1997 with, uh, I believe, the studies of the Nolly Allen group. Um, but uh, studies to determine its prevalence in the population are still needed. Uh, and here I'm not talking about patient type headache, which has a really high uh, prevalence in the population, migraine, which has a prevalence of about 10% in the population. But we're really talking about those that manifest primary in the lower thirds of the face. And occur, uh, recently, uh, we have this algorithm to uh, differentiating uh, the subtypes of NVOP. And, but this is beyond the scope uh, the scope of the our talk today, but it's important to know that it exists and uh, uh, to know, especially for a clinician, to know how to diagnose and to differentially diagnose them. 
And the third group uh, are the musculoskeletal or facial pain conditions classified under the umbrella of temporomandibular disorders, which are those disorders affecting the temporomandibular joints and or uh, the muscles of mastication and associated uh, related structures. These conditions have a prevalence of 3 to 12 percent uh, worldwide. Uh, they have an annual incidence recently estimated at 4%, uh, and the annual TMD healthcare costs have been estimated in over $4 billion, you know, highlighting treatment needs for these patients. Uh, an interesting uh, fact as well is that TMDs are the second most common musculoskeletal condition resulting in pain and disability following only uh, chronic low back pain. Uh, so this really highlights the need for more research uh, because these conditions, they have, they exhibit exhibit great inter-individual variability, not, not only in clinical manifestation, but in the personal experience of pain, uh, response to treatment, uh, and that largely drives, uh, uh, you know, our inability to accurately diagnose TMDs. Uh, and what I mean when I say that, I'm not talking about an atomic-based TMD classification. For that, we have an excellent tool back in 1992 um, to working in La Reche published the research diagnostic criteria for temporomandibular disorders that was very accepted, uh, well accepted in the field and with the collaboration of, the, of a variety of experts has evolved into the DC uh, uh, TMD uh, which is applicable to not only for research but also for clinical practice and by using the DC TMD you can get high levels of sensitivity and specificity for classifying the most common types of TMD. But what I mean is that this classification doesn't come attached to an ideology. It doesn't tell you why that pain is, it just tells you where that pain is. Uh, so as consequence, uh, there is a lack of effective treatment. Uh, we know TMDs and other chronic pain conditions, they're highly refractory to treatment which just means that we need to focus our research efforts uh, to be able to provide better, better care for our chronic pain patients. And that is not to say that there hasn't been enough uh, research uh, in the field. Uh, so basically in the past 90 years of research, roughly 90 years of research, uh, which is when we can say uh, in the early 30s is probably when uh, Team D's first appeared as an entity and uh, research has been devoted to it since then. Uh, a lot has happened, a lot of research, a lot of good research has, uh, has uh, been carried out, so much so that uh, we have seen a huge shift in paradigm which went from uh, a dentally oriented point of view in which solely occlusion and uh, structural problems were seen as the source or the cause of uh, these conditions to a different scenario in which today we understand that these are multi-level conditions and as the main uh, healthcare providers responsible for uh, giving care to chronic oral facial pain patients, we can no longer look only at occlusion, structural relationships in the oral facial region and cervical posture, and uh, but we are looking at the whole patient. We know that psychological, psych psychosocial factors uh, really matter and have an impact. Genetic factors are here to stay, and we know as well that they influence how we uh, experience pain. Uh, so it has been a really um, transformative, uh, the research has been really transformative from, from this aspect that we know much more today, enough that, uh, you know, 180 degree shift uh, in the way we treat TMDs has, has resolved this consequence, has uh, come as a result from this research. Uh, and to understand this a little better, uh, we're going to briefly talk about the, the history, uh, and, uh, which, is, which I think is really uh, interesting to understand the, how things have evolved over time. So as I said, probably 
you know, the field, the uh, TMD began as a field, uh, probably as a, a lateral transfer from the otolaryngology profession uh, in the 30s. Uh, there are some, even some papers that appeared even uh, before that, but it really was the work of Costin in the early 30s that established uh, the TMJ or the TMD uh, as a separate source uh, of facial pain itself. Uh, and of course, we have, let's say, many thanks to give to that because, uh, you know, it really was uh, the, the, the landmark of establishing TMDs as, as their own entity. But uh, the, the work of Costin as well, it was served as basis for two propositions that dominated the field for years to come that had, you know, one of them that these so-called TMJ problems uh, were solely a result of structural problems between uh, the mandible, the jaw, and the skull, and two, that only dentists could take care of TMD uh, patients because it's a problem uh, between the mandible and the skull is the, of the jurisdiction of the dentist. So this, uh, this, these thoughts have, uh, have dominated the field for many years, um, and uh, the, the, the theories to explain uh, TMD as a problem that followed were largely based in it. We would, and we read often terms that are more or less synonyms, such as overclosed vertical dimension, condylar malposition, trapped mandibles, occlusal disharmony, uh, neuromuscular imbalance, and other terms that all, that all have their origin. Uh, more or less in the first uh, in those first work works of Cotton and his group, uh, and then not uh, long after that we have also the orthodontic profession that uh, also had their own version of structural disharmony concepts and uh, corrective treatments. Uh, throughout the years, this largely uh, converged into uh, the structural structural and mal malalignment concepts originally proposed uh, by Costin. Uh, and even though uh, this is not a criticism, I'm not here to criticize uh, orthodontics by far, it has its, apl its applications. It is necessary some uh, many times. Uh, but all I'm saying is that I think we can clearly say now that the orthodontic instrumentation uh, have not been shown to be of specific value either in diagnosing or in treating TMD patients. So when it comes to TMD and its etiology or even treating it, we know that that is not enough. Uh, another structural concept that came after that and that became very popular was that of bad craniocervical postural relationships causing TMD. Uh, and this is still very popular even in, in some uh, regions of the world. But there are several studies showing uh, that there are no consistent postural findings that differentiate TMD patients from normal subjects. We know that. In more recent years, um, larger uh, population studies also gave rise to uh, theories involving trauma, either at macro or ma uh, macro or micro level trauma, uh, which, you know, for sure uh, there is a correlation between uh, trauma either at macro or micro level and the onset of uh, TMD symptoms, but uh, cause relationship, uh, a causal relationship has uh, yet to uh, be uh, established. Uh, there is a very recent, uh, a recent paper, I think 2017, from um, Sharma uh, and Orbach, uh, in which they show that history of trauma, of uh, extrinsic trauma to, to the mandible, to the orofacial region, has impacts. Uh, people that have history of trauma have higher chances of developing TMD. So this is just to say that I'm sure it is. It can be one of the factors involved in it, especially in the onset in acute TMD. But again, when we're talking about chronic TMD, we have to go beyond that. 
And then it was in the 50s and in the 60s uh, that both uh, groups in the Columbia University with uh, Schwartz, Marbach, uh, and others, and the University of Illinois with Laskin, Green, and Lupton, that they proposed a psychophysiologic basis for TMD. And throughout the past now 50 years, 60 years, that concept has uh, been widely accepted. Uh, and the strict relationship between uh, psychosocial factors and chronic pain conditions in general, not only orofacial, uh, has been sufficiently demonstrated. So nowadays, the most or the widely accepted uh, concept to explain uh, chronic orofacial pain is the one that we refer to as the biopsychosocial model, uh, which I believe this definition comes from uh, uh, one of Ockerson's book on, on this matter, where he describes uh, the biopsychosocial model as follows. You know, patients have a biologic problem, uh, the activation of pain pathways with or without demonstrable pathology, which may have psychological antecedents as well as behavioral consequences. The situation exists in a social framework that includes interpersonal relationships with friends, families, and health providers, which almost always produce major negative experiences for the patients themselves. So I, I thought that this was a very good uh, summary explanation of uh, what the biopsychosocial model entails. And here, in this next slide, uh, I actually... So let's say that this is a diagram of the psycho biopsychosocial model applied to TMDs. Uh, it has been uh, uh, published by the, the group of Dr. Maxner back in 2011, I believe, 10 years ago. But it contextualizes that very much. We see uh, on the one hand, uh, high amplification uh, state of things. So here we would have biological factors such as neuroendocrine function. Perhaps we can talk about the HPA axis function uh, and stress and how that affects pain. Autonomic function, function which we know as well has a uh, relationship with chronic pain. Impaired pain regulation, a pro-inflammatory state. Uh, and on the other group here, we have high, high psycholo psychological distress mood, anxiety, depression, stress response, somatization, these are all uh, psychological domains uh, that, one, uh, that one has. And so these two groups talk to each other and influence each other. And on their background, we have genetic factors. So these are some listed down at the bottom are some of the genes that have been implicated in chronic pain and chronic orofacial pain. And all of this happens, if we look in the left hand, in, in an environment that can contribute to it. And this will include, you know, this trauma, infection, perhaps exposure to environmental contaminants, uh, life stressors, uh, your social network, you know, your support network, your culture, your health, your beliefs, your religion, your demographics, if you're a minority group, uh, if you, if you, um, if you're part of a, a discriminated group and all of that uh, for sure impacts the experience of pain. So all of that combined uh, make a susceptible organism that eventually develops subclinical signs and symptoms that develop into uh, first onset pain and that can evolve to chronic pain. Uh, so this is a snapshot, let's call it, like that of the biopsychosocial model applied to TMDs. Uh, but I'll, I'll just repeat and say that we could have here not only persistent TMD, we could have other chronic pain conditions as we now know that this applies to all chronic pain conditions. They are highly overlapping. We know what well, we strongly believe that they have shared at least in part, uh, their etiology has uh, a lot in common. Uh, so this, of course, in general terms, is where we are now. Uh, but how exactly this helps us 
uh, treat our patients is a different and a separate question. So that is the question. How does this help us understand individual patients? And the truth is that it doesn't right now, at least um, let, let me be a bit more specific. Of course it does because now we are no longer we're no longer proposing what are occlusal adjustments or irreversible uh, dental treatments to to uh, treat TMD patients. Uh, we now support and encourage what's called a high prudence, low tech uh, treatment. Uh, so really working with perhaps oral splints uh, and analgesics and then perhaps moving forward uh, to quote uh, stronger medications, working with a psychologist, uh, working uh, in conjunction with a physiotherapist. Anyway, we're not going to go into the details now, but this is my point here is that although we understand that all of those factors play a role, uh, we're not able to identify these factors. We don't know specifically how these factors interact to cause pain. Therefore, we don't know how to identify them in patients and how to treat patients based on those factors. Uh, so then the next question is, well, then how does this help us understand groups of TMD patients? And uh, that's uh, what uh, I am focusing on now. And that's how I see us moving forward now. Uh, going from the bigger to the smaller to the individual will take time, will take research, will take much more understanding. So I don't think we're at the point where we can try to understand the patient at the individual level, but we are at the stage where we can try to understand groups, less heterogeneous groups of patients and at the stage where that may help us provide that care. So this all started uh, with uh, the OPERA study, uh, the orofacial pain perspective evaluation of faster evaluation and risk factors assessment. I think that's what it stands for. Um, here, just a, you know, a, a brief uh, moment just to honor Dr. William Maxner that recently passed and uh, had a huge impact in, in, in my uh, in my education as a researcher and in the work that I do. Uh, and he directed this, that was the largest uh, study conducted to date aimed at identifying the biopsychosocial factors associated with uh, risk of uh, developing TMD. To give you a little bit more context into the opera study, and very briefly, we're not going to go into the details of the opera study here, but um, uh, my work is based on the initial findings and, and data of the opera study. Uh, OPERA had as main goal to uh, identify the biopsychosocial factors uh, associated risk of developing uh, TMD. So they really had they had an inception cohort of over 3,000 uh, 3, people that were followed up every three months. Uh, and of those 260 developed first onset TMD. And these were all clinically verified TMD. These people came back into the, one of their study sites. Uh, people were recruited from different sites across the U.S. The OPERA study was uh, the, the largest study that we have to date that aimed to identify the biopsychosocial factors associated with risk of developing TMD. Uh, to understand uh, their fight, and we're not going to dig deep into the OPERA studies, just that uh, uh, the hypothesis that we're working on uh, came from uh, OPERA data set and some of their findings just so that you understand how the OPERA uh, study was conducted. They had uh, an inception cohort of over 3,000 people uh, without TMD or without any chronic pain condition for that matter. Uh, and these people were followed up every three months uh over i think a total amount of time of nearly three years at the end uh for the whole study but they identified 260 incident cases of first first onset tmds in that study 
uh, but they also had a baseline case control arm that we see here on the left. Uh, so they recruited uh, now uh, this number, which says here 185 baseline cases of chronic TMD. It's actually uh, nearly a thousand cases uh, at the end. And this was a community-based recruitment and uh, different uh, sites uh, across the US, adults between uh, 18 and 44 years old with no significant uh, medical conditions or history uh, of facial recent facial injury. Uh, and one of the interesting, uh, of the most interesting uh, findings, I believe, from the OPERA study is the one that was published by Eric Baer in 2016. Uh, so what OPERA did to its participants, they were ran through a battery of um, uh, assessments that included, you know, uh, psychophysical tests, pressure pain sensitivity tests, the uh, psychosocial questionnaires, Social uh, demographic characteristics were assessed. They also underwent a clinical examination according to the RDC TMD criteria. Uh, so what they did with the group of Eric Barrett is they ran all of this. I, I put a little funnel here through a series of tests uh, that involved uh, a, a clustering method, and they identified. They were able to identify three distinct groups uh, or three groups with with uh, distinct characteristics uh, and these groups can be uh, they can be um, determined using measures of pressure pain sensitivity uh, and uh, anxiety depression and somatic symptoms as reported by the patients so they term these three groups as adaptive uh, pain sensitive and global symptoms the first group of patients, has low pain sensitivity and uh, no psychosomatic symptoms. The second group, the pain sensitive group, has high pain sensitivity but uh, no psychosomatic symptoms. And the global symptoms cluster has high pain sensitivity and also a, a lot of psychosomatic symptoms. Uh, so this is a, a, a snapshot of the characteristics of these three groups. So we see in the darker gray bar, people belonging to the adaptive uh, cluster. So we have here in the x-axis, these are the, the z-scores. Uh, and we see how all the, the gray bars are pointing to the left. So we have here, you know, pressure pain sensitivity in the trapezius, mechanical after sensation. So these are all measures of pain sensitivity. And then uh, starting here at prey, neuroticism, we have several uh, psychoso uh, psychosomatic measures, and we see how these people are neither pain sensitive nor they uh, exhibit uh, a lot of psycho uh, psychosomatic symptoms compared to the other clusters. Then we have the pain sensitive cluster, which is the medium gray bar, and we see how they are pain sensitive, they are uh, very sensitive to pain, but uh, they have very little. Uh, psychosomatic symptoms and then the third group which is the global symptoms cluster has uh, it's pain sensitive and it also has a lot uh, compared to the other two groups a lot more uh, psychosomatic symptoms and in uh, trying to validate their findings they also reproduced this in an independent cohort in their paper which was very nice to see with very high accuracy I think uh, it was 85 percent uh, but they also did something interesting, as uh, I mentioned before, um, they had a cohort of, of over 3,000 people that were TMD-free and were followed up. So they gathered all of those people and using the measures of pressure, pain sensitivity, anxiety, depression, and somatic symptoms, they clustered them into one of those three groups. And over the course of years, what we see here is that the probability of those belonging to the global symptoms clusters of remaining pain-free is significantly reduced compared to the other two clusters. Uh, so we're probably talking about a higher group of people uh, at a higher group of developing pain here. So that was very interesting. However, there are some uh, issues uh, with this uh, clustering among others, but uh, as I already said, these people were uh, recruited from the community uh, and oh, this is going without me come on 
were recruited from the community, so we were not really sure if it applied to clinical populations, the ones that are the ones that are people that are really seeking treatment. And we also don't know how clusters uh, as, cluster assignment behaves longitudinally, and that's to say that is to say that if the idea is that which we believe is the case that these clusters represent groups of people with a less heterogeneous source of fame uh, that can potentially be used to inform uh, clinical practice. Uh, but if that is the case, we would expect cluster assignment to be uh, somewhat stable. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit of this, uh, a little bit about this further ahead. So the first question was, do clusters apply to clinical populations? And there are many, there were a few steps that we took to try to answer uh, that question. And this has already been published by the group of Shedsmith uh, in 2020, recent paper. Uh, can we use a clinically ap applicable instrument? That is because the original, um, the original instrument used to assess those psychosomatic symptoms, specifically anxiety, depression, and the report of somatic symptoms that go into the al uh, clustering algorithm, they were measured with a, a scale that is called the Symptom Checklist 90, and it contains 90 items, and it's very lengthy and not compatible with uh, clinical practice. So. Uh, we try to see if using the BSI-18, which is basically a compact version of the SCL-90, uh, would yield the same results. So first thing that we did was to uh, evaluate the correlation between SCL-90 and BSI, uh, not in the OPERA cohort itself, but also in a cohort, this CPPC cohort is a cohort of chronic pain patients. So here we don't have, don't have only TMD patients, but we also have back pain patients, fibromyalgia, uh, IBS, and vulvodynia. I, uh, I think I mentioned them all. So using two different cohorts, we evaluated the, the, the degree of correlation between these two scales, which is uh, excellent. So we went forward and using measures derived from the BSI and not from the SEL, we also attempted to fine tune the clustering algorithm to chronic pain, pain, pain patients, uh, because as I mentioned, uh, the way that it was originally done by the group of Bear, uh, and which is attached to the design of the opera study that was based on community recruitment, though those were not representative of the people that are actually seeking care. So uh, with data that was uh, we could use, that was um, Dr. Maxner kindly allowed us to use from the CPPC cohort, again, a cohort of chronic pain patients, we applied the clustering algorithm and we submitted it to GAP statistic, which uh, uh, we're not going to go into the details, but this is just to show that using the clustering algorithm that they developed, but uh, the BSI-18, the compact clinical measure, we also were able to identify three clusters of patients in the CPPC cohort. And then the next question is, okay, is, are these clusters that we identify uh, similar to those that were described originally? And this is just a shorter version of the first uh, uh, plot that you saw of the opera patients. And this is a plot of the CPPC patients for the same measures. So we have here the trapezius pressure, pain threshold, somatization, depression, and anxiety. And we have those same characteristics with the adaptive being uh, tolerant to pain and no psychosomatic symptoms. And this getting worse uh, until the global symptoms cluster who has who is pain sensitive and also has uh, a lot of psychosomatic symptoms. Uh, and then the next question that we wanted to answer, can we apply this fine-tuned uh, clustering algorithm to TMD patients specifically, to a clinical population of TMD patients? So, for, uh, so here we're talking of patients that are seeking care at a tertiary uh, pain clinic. Uh, and we see that uh, we were able to classify them into these three clusters and that clusters have that same uh, uh, that same uh, characteristic. 
Uh, and here, this is very preliminary uh, data that we're starting to look in, into the clinical characteristics of these patients and how they associate with cluster assignment. So this, uh, these is, are measures of clinical pain where people are asked to rate on a zero to 10 scale their uh, average pain intensity and how pain interferes with their uh, enjoyment of life and with general life activities where zero is like no pain or no interference and 10 is the most pain and uh, most uh, interference. And we see here that people belonging to the global symptom clusters are those reporting higher clinical pain sensitivity and also not pain sensitivity, but higher clinical pain and also higher uh, pain interference with either with enjoyment and with general activity. Uh, so we believe that this, uh, you know, this is the group uh, and, you know, where do we even see this going? First of all, do clusters apply to clinical populations? Yes. Nope. Um, and then the way we see this going, as I already mentioned, is we believe that these clusters can help us at least uh, fine-tune treatment for patients. And although we do not have a specific treatments that are targeted, and this is part of our goal, is to then investigate the within groups, within cluster, collect uh, a lot of biological information. So from, you know, blood for DNA, uh, for DNA genotyping, RNA sequencing, uh, plasma proteins. We're also collecting cells for uh, immunophenotyping. So the idea is to combine uh, these data to try to identify the mechanisms underlying pain within these groups uh, and hoping that that will lead us to not necessarily develop new treatments, uh, pharmacological treatments, but at least to put together treatment strategies that will be tailored to the mechanisms underlying pain within these groups. So to get there, we are working uh, on identifying if clusters are temporally stable, um, and we don't expect them to be forever stable because I, uh, we believe that, uh, and I believe that uh, events that may happen, somebody starts a new treatment or they uh, learn how to better cope with their pain, or perhaps they go through a stressful event in their life. So the the, the these mechanisms underlying pain may shift uh, in uh, in response to different events that happen uh, in our life and within our body. So we don't expect it to be forever stable, but we expect it to be short term uh, stable. So we are measuring the uh, one month temporal stability. And the idea uh, is that this cluster assignment would also be able to predict pain improvement in a direction that people belonging to, you know, people that come up to the clinic and that you're able to classify them into, oh, this person belongs to the adaptive cluster. It's likely that they will recover. That's the way we see this going. Whereas people that belong to the global symptom clusters are those that will require, uh, you know, more uh, attention and because they will be the ones that are more likely to continue to experience pain. Uh, and likewise, uh, we are now investigating if clusters predict response to first-line uh, therapies. So for TMDs, uh, and I believe uh, that is normal for other, um, for other pain specialties, we usually go up a treatment ladder that varies from case to case, but you starts with biofeedback, perhaps occlusal splint and NSAIDs and analgesics, uh, going up to other medications, muscle relaxants, tricyclic, antidepressants, uh, dry needling, and the very, very few cases and very well and recommended cases, even surgeries. Uh, but if we, and while we are trying, this is pretty much based on a trial and error strategy because we don't have any guidelines. We don't know how to, to better guide treatment. So the idea is that if we know that a patient belongs to, to the cluster, to the global symptom cluster, for instance, you can at least readily put this patient through a, let's say a larger battery of treatments, immediately work in a multidisciplinary team to target pain from the psychological aspect, 
from the dentist point of view with the help of a physiotherapist as well you know to try to tackle it from multiple angles when it's needed so you could skip first line therapies as sole forms of treatment for these patients in hope to in the hope of targeting their pain mechanisms so yeah we are not uh, at the level of helping individual patients yet uh, there was a lot of uh, you know this is where we're hoping to go i guess medicine precision medicine is the perhaps the final goal of uh, the the health research nowadays where we're going to be able to identify exactly what is wrong or what needs to be adjusted in a patient to provide pain relief uh, but we're not there yet uh, and i think the way to get there is to start to decrease heterogeneity among patients and uh, perhaps this is one way to go so just to go back to the, the the theme of this talk today which is from where we've been to where we will go i think we have uh, you know it would, this has been a pretty long and successful journey so far we went from this little guy blue guy here uh, and we looked at him only from a dentally oriented point of view, looking at only the occlusion and alignments of jaw. Uh, and then with the availability availability of larger data sets, and now we moved forward uh, into this larger studies that we could see that the picture was, you know, that we were only seeing a very small part of the picture. So we could uh, evolve a lot of our knowledge and we saw all of those theories, which are not all, but are perhaps the, the most popular theories that try to uh, explain TMD's ideology over the years. And I think that nowadays we are approaching the, the third image here, which is people characterized in subgroups, which are more similar to each other. And in within these groups, we hope that we'll be able to identify more specific mechanisms of pain to then eventually move into personalized medicine where we're looking at each person individually and able to deliver the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. So with apologies for the technical difficulties that we had, and I don't even know how we are time-wise, but I want to thank you everybody and thank you to Gary and uh, Chris again. And these are some of my collaborators here and people that are currently funding my research and I can take any questions right now that you may have. Thank you so much, Carol. I appreciate that. Uh, we do have some time for questions. Um, in the On the panel towards the bottom, there's a question box. You can write them in. Um, and um, yeah, let me just say as the questions are coming in that um, really appreciate your presentation. You know, it's it's so important. Uh, most of our partners at, at Abios are doing really preclinical research, but it's so important to have meaningful clinical trials. Uh, otherwise, all that uh, hard research is is for naught. I, I wondered, in the past year, have you noticed um, more difficulty in recruiting for clinical trials because of the the global pandemic? Oh, a hundred percent. This is yeah. Uh, yeah. Everybody doing clinical research has got stuck uh, for the past year, uh, which is including this work that we're <laughs> currently uh, discussing. So yeah, I've been really because some of it can be done. Some clinical research can still be done using like telemedicine. Uh, mm -hmm. but it is, it's not the case here. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately this really affected us big time. Okay. Hoping yeah, to I get back so. on track I'm, now with the vaccines. Yeah. So, uh, before we go to the questions, I just promised everyone to show the results of the, the poll. Um, can you see that, uh, there? Um, the first question, do you work with human DRGs in your pain research? So 56% um, people said no, uh, that they don't work with human DRGs in the research, and 44% said yes. So that was interesting. And then um, for the next question, uh, what are the barriers to working with DRGs? 59% said all of the above. Uh, mm -hmm. Mixture, 12% uh, available, 18% cost. Interesting that 6% no barriers, so I guess they have a reliable source. Um, then with spinal cords, um, much more said no, and hopefully antibiotics, we can change that with our availability of, of uh, spinal cord samples. And um, let's see, there's the results for that, 94% said no. 
and then um, uh, most of those had um, all the above or were barriers. So, okay. Um, so let, let me get to some questions from the audience. Um, are there plasma biomarkers that can be used to identify the different clusters in the clinical population? Not, no, this is, uh, and more, more than me, this is what the group at Duke, Shad Smith, and uh, his collaborators at Duke are looking at right now. Uh, but we are, the, the line where this, the, this is following is actually some uh, preliminary data that we have based on uh, the immune phenotypes of the, distant, the, the different clusters, uh, which they seem to be distinct. As, oops, I don't have uh, the full picture yet, but uh, the global symptoms mm -hmm. cluster seems to be shifting towards an NK uh, activation, and that could it's likely to be identifiable, some markers be identifiable in plasma, but this is, as I said, this is something that we're currently working on, so hopefully. Okay. Yeah, and is gender representation different for the various clusters you've described? Uh, yes, so in the, and first of all, gender representation is uh, different uh, in chronic pain period, right, if we have a uh, depending on the, the specific condition, but for TMDs, we have a three to one ratio, so it's preferably win, in women. Uh, but yes, we have uh, not super, um, the ratio is not super uh, large, but we have a preference for females in the global symptoms cluster compared to males. Interesting, okay. Thank you very much. Well, we are um, getting close to the top of the hour. I just wanna, uh, once again, Thank you, Carol, for providing an excellent presentation. I'd like to thank my colleague, Gary Watkins, for putting this together. Uh, thanks to the audience for participating in the poll. And uh, as I mentioned before, there are some handouts that you can download. Um, I'll give you a moment to do that before we shut down the webinar. Uh, but once again, thank you for all of you for participating in this webinar, and we wish you all the best in your research. Thanks again, Carol. Thank you. Bye.